Hey, what's up you lot, Path here. Today I want to start a new series on my channel, one which I'll hopefully actually turn into a series rather than just the first episode of a series. I want to talk to you about what happens when physics goes wrong. Whether that's what happens when certain accepted theories start to break down in certain places, or whether that's because physicists, specifically the humans doing the physics, do things in a stupid way because there is a lot of that. And today I want to start off with a fairly mundane, but still quite interesting example of what happens when physicists do things in a really strange way. You know, just to ease us into talking about what happens when physics starts to break down a little bit, just uh, as a nice little intro, if you like, to this world of dodgy physics. Now, if you saw my previous video, you'll remember that I described what happens when an electron meets what's known as a potential barrier using a graph that looks like this. Don't worry if you don't know what a potential barrier is, by the way. And I guess to some extent, if you don't even know what an electron is, that's not the point of this video. What we're talking about today specifically though, is the fact that this scenario can be really nicely described by using a graph. The graph helps us visualize what's going on because on the horizontal axis, the x-axis, if you will, what we're plotting is the position of an electron. So as the electron moves from left to right, we can plot this position on the horizontal axis. And on the vertical axis, we're plotting energy, whether that's the energy of the potential barrier that the electron is encountering, or the energy of the electron itself. Again, if you're not too sure what I mean by all of these things, it doesn't matter. All you need to know for this video is that on the horizontal axis, we've got position, and on the vertical axis, we've got energy. Now this diagram worked really nicely when we were describing the motion of our electron using classical physics. But as soon as we introduced quantum mechanics into this picture, things just got a little bit more complicated. And I don't just mean conceptually. When we brought quantum mechanics into the picture, we realized that an electron does not have a well-defined position until we actually measure it. All we knew about the electron is the probability with which we could find that electron in certain locations along the horizontal axis. All of that information was encoded in what's known as the wave function of the electron. Now, just as a quick summary, we found that the wave function for this particular region looked like a sine curve, and any peaks or troughs of the sine curve correspond to the positions at which we're most likely to find the electron, and these are the positions at which we're least likely to find the electron. Again, these specifics don't really matter, though if you want to learn about it, check out my previous video, but some of you might have by this point spotted a problem with the way that we've drawn this graph. Don't worry if you haven't though, it's quite subtle. Remember that the uppy downiness of the wave function is actually encoding the probability with which we will find the electron in a certain position. It's not encoding the energy of the electron. The energy of the electron is actually constant. And in fact, that's the reason why the sine curve representing the wave function was drawn specifically there, as opposed to like here or something, which is what would happen if the electron had more energy. So the whole point of this is that this diagram is slightly misleading if you don't know how to read it properly. You might think that the wave function is telling us that the energy of the electron is fluctuating up and down. What we really need to make this diagram more understandable is a third axis, one which represents the wave function rather than the energy of the electron. So for example, we could draw a diagram that looks a little bit like this. However, there are a couple of problems with this diagram. Firstly, drawing a diagram like this on a 2D piece of paper is actually quite difficult, especially if you're just making a quick sketch. And as well as this, interpreting a diagram like this is quite difficult as well. How do you read off values accurately from each axis? We could avoid this whole 3D problem though by just having another axis on the right-hand side of our graph. We could have a vertical axis that represents the wave function reading, and we could label this clearly, and the left-hand side vertical axis represents the energy reading. So the uppy downiness of the wave function is actually read off on the right-hand side vertical axis and the energy of the electron, the dotted line, is actually read off on the left-hand side vertical axis. Now this kind of works, but it adds to the clunkiness of the diagram. It becomes more cumbersome to draw, probably more cumbersome to interpret as well, but there is another problem with this. It's all well and good for drawing one particular wave function. We could just say that the zero displacement position of the wave function is this position here, and then any upward or downward displacements of the wave function from this position are just the up down in nature of the wave function, whatever that means, that's not important to us right now. And like I said, this is all well and good for drawing what happens when we've got one electron with one particular energy, but maybe the electron could have slightly higher energy and we want to plot this on the same graph. Well, in that case, we'd have to have another zero point and then things get really messy then because you've got multiple readings on the same axis and yeah, no. 
And the other sort of elephant in the room, quite frankly, that I've been avoiding is the fact that a wave function does not have to be real. It can take complex values. But this is a problem with all different ways of drawing our diagram. The fact that the wave function isn't necessarily real. In some diagrams, I've seen just the real part of the wave function drawn. In other diagrams, I've seen the real part and the imaginary part drawn separately. And at that point, the diagram starts to get real cluttered. So essentially, these diagrams, regardless of which way we draw them, are just useful as a basic visualization tool in most cases. Incorporating all of the information that we would want to know from these diagrams is actually a really difficult task. So the way that physicists currently draw these diagrams with energy on the vertical axis and position on the horizontal axis and an expectation that their reader will know that the wave function upy downiness is not a change in energy is kind of reasonable. These diagrams help us to visually convey ideas without necessarily having to look at the full mathematics. And also, even if you do look at the full mathematics, there's nothing quite like a good picture. But the key is that we know how to interpret the diagram correctly. So I feel like these diagrams in general are an okay compromise when it comes to all of the things that we need to consider. Generally, the decisions made when drawing these diagrams are reasonable, they're understandable at least but the same cannot be said for other conventions that physicists use. Really, really irritating conventions. Some of you might have had to use conventional current, for example, in your physics lessons. But that rant I'm gonna save for another video. Yes, it's just a short one today. I just wanted to show you some of the problems with drawing diagrams like this. And just to start off the series where I talk about problems with physics, whether that's problems with theories in physics or problems with the way that physicists do things. Now listen, physics is the best thing that we have when it comes to describing the behavior of the universe. It is based on an extremely rigorous process of gathering strong evidence. Furthermore, the competition between physicists and scientists in general means that they try and prove each other wrong rather than trying to prove each other right. So I'm not making this series to try and discredit physics or the work that physicists do or the scientific method. I just want to show that there's a reason why physics is an ongoing process because there's actually a lot of work still to be done. Everything that we discovered to be incorrect, we set out to correct immediately. But things that aren't technically incorrect but just annoying, well, our human nature kicks in at that point and we just go, eh, it's fine, we'll deal with it. <laughs> so with all of that being said, that's the end of this video. If you wanna stick around for announcements, stick around right now. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that I'm gonna be starting a second YouTube channel pretty soon. I'm gonna be releasing some music on that. So if you're interested in listening to any of my music, stick around, I'll let you guys know more as I, as I know more. And aside from that, I just wanted to say thank you to all of you who support me, anyone who leaves a thumbs up on my videos, anyone who leaves a comment, anyone who's subscribed to my channel and watches my videos regularly, thank you so much. I will see you very, very soon. Bye-bye.